these are things that we put up on the website and I, I, I took it off of, off of the website itself. So hearing that back and just rewinding on my journey has been, has been something that I've, I've been thrown down into a memory lane, but thank you so much for having me here today. Um, what I'm going to essentially do is just take a quick poll around the room. If you guys can tell me uh, whether you guys are in ninth, 10th, 11th or 12th grade, I can customize the sort of the structure for today's meeting based on that. So quickly, if you guys can essentially go over um, the chat section and very quickly tell me which grades you're in so that I can get a better idea of what the room is looking like and then customize some of the stuff for that. Yeah. So I see a bunch of students that are in grade 10, 11, 9, all the way. I, I see someone from eighth grade joining us as well. Okay. There's someone from seventh grade as well. Sounds good. All right. So it looks like it's a pretty mixed sort of a room with um, students coming in from grades ninth onwards till 12th. What that tells me is the kind of the kind of ideas that you guys need to understand, the timelines that you essentially need to establish, all of those are things that you want to absolutely get started as early as possible, irrespective of whether it's admissions abroad or admissions within any university in India as such. So it's great that you guys are attending the session. What I'm going to do from my perspective is just break down a bunch of different things that are required to build what we would consider a strong profile and then walk you through how you build individual components to both crack um, admissions abroad as well as crack internal Indian system admissions as well. All right. Uh, so I am, I am not one of those boring professors who comes up with a 20 page slide deck or anything of that sort. What I'm going to do is really quickly run you through very, very few slides. All of my slides are going to be heavy in terms of information, but in a bullet point. Once we are through with the slides and while we are uh, going through a bunch of these slides, if you could add in all of the questions that you have in the chat section, I will keep coming back to each one of those questions when it is relevant. I have the chat section open in front of me. I'm looking at all of the questions and the audience responses, et cetera. So make it easy for me, ask, ask me any questions that you guys have. I'm more than happy to essentially go deep dive into specific topics of anything that we cover today. Um, what I'm gonna do also is structure the presentation to about 20 to 25 minutes, and then leave the rest of the time for rich questions from the audience. Um, questions that you think everyone that is joining us today can benefit from. And then for personal questions, we will leave the hotline and the Gradvine pre-consultation call on the website open for you guys. Um, you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one with me or with some of the other mentors that are on the platform, just going onto the website itself. All right, let me go ahead, share my screen, and then um, I'll get you guys started on today's session. All right, let me know when you can see my screen. Just give me a thumbs up, anyone. Chat section would be great. All right, thank you. Okay, so today's session is essentially going to be about profile building for undergraduate admissions. While the emphasis itself is going to be a little more on the profile building for undergraduate admissions abroad, a lot of these takeaways can be applied to universities within India, specifically the holistic or the, um, the new age liberal arts institutions or institutions that also consider everything else that you've done as a high school student, apart from just the test course that you essentially have. So if there are universities in India which follow the holistic application process and don't just look at the JE, the JE mains or any of the other standardized tests, and are open to considering the rest of the profile, then this session is essentially for you guys. Of course, for students that are looking to go abroad, both to the US, to any country literally outside of India, most universities will go through the entire um, holistic application process. And I'm gonna break down specific parts of the application process, tell you what universities consider a good or a strong profile, break down what profile includes and then give you tips and tricks that you can use to build your profile for admissions. Uh, let me just do a quick introduction. 
like uh, Sikandha Ma'am said, I am I am one of the founders of a peer-to-peer -peer mentorship firm. We have about 600 to 700 different mentors. Every single one, just like me, has gone on to a top 10 or a top 20 university abroad. And these are the guys that sit down with prospective applicants or prospective students, sit with them one-on-one, -on -one, go through all of the things that they have done during high school, and then make sure to essentially assimilate a lot of information, figure out or help figure out interests, help figure out careers, help figure out what courses you could apply to as a major minor combination, and then help you with the entire logistics or the application processes for each one of them. So that's what Gradvine essentially does. Um, and just in terms of background, I have a master's degree from Carnegie Mellon, a top five university in the world for the degree that I pursued. Um, like she said, I also went on to clerk for, intern for, and then work full time with the governor, the, back then, uh, the governor uh, in the state of California, and then moved on to doing a lot of stuff in data science specifically. The idea for Gradvine essentially came about when both Srikar, who's my co-founder, and I were starting to apply to universities ourselves. We felt that there is this big lack of credible advice, on the ground advice that students or anyone else is giving us from on the ground, from the right programs, from people who are already at the same universities and the courses that we were trying to pursue. Therefore, we built up this platform. And uh, again, if you, if you guys need to reach us, the number is uh, below. You can also reach us for a free consultation call on the website. All right, let's look at the agenda for today. What does profile building include? What does a good profile consist of? What does it mean to say I have a very strong profile? How do you figure out various options between majors, minors, et cetera, and choose the right combinations for yourself? Every, sing every single student that comes to us from high school, from most of the IB, the CBSE, or the other curricula, seems to be hinting at being able to do projects, being able to do various internships, or being involved in leadership activities. What are these different things? Should you or should you not uh, get into any one or two or 20 of these? And what is a good balance? We'll talk about that. One of the most important things is also to demonstrate interest, which is another subtopic that I'm going to cover today. And if there is one single thing that you take away from the conversation today, let it be point number seven. Start every single application process as early as possible. That is the biggest tidbit you can get. I am giving you a free sneak peek at it, free preview of it. But make sure if you are someone who's looking to apply abroad or within India, start the application process as early as possible. Start thinking about it at least as soon as possible. All right, let's get started. So one of the biggest myths that is around is the fact that universities are looking for well-rounded individuals. Unfortunately, that is what it is. It's a myth. Universities are not looking for well-rounded individuals. Universities want to build well-rounded classrooms of students from various diverse aspects and specializations and make the entire university or campus community as holistic or well-rounded as possible. So the, the key difference here is the fact that universities are not looking for um, uh, a jack of all, master of none. Instead of well-rounded students, universities actually aim to build well-rounded classrooms. Let's say a classroom comprises of, uh, of about 50, 60 students. Universities are looking to find as diverse profiles as possible, people who've specialized, who've taken the time out, showcase their interests and specialized in specific things as part of their high school. So various specialities, various interests, various sort of activities that students have participated in, all of that come together in terms of a well-rounded classroom. And that is what overall contributes, that, that, that is exactly what contributes to the overall campus community, to the overall alumni class, even once you guys graduate, and therefore universities are very, very picky about the kind of specialist students that they're going to be picking. So what does a good profile look like? A good profile, unfortunately, is not one where a student has involved himself or herself in 20 different activities in 10 different clubs, at the leadership position of seven of them, but 
only scratch the surface of every single one of those. If you are looking to get into a top 20, top 30, top 40, or a top 50 university in the US or in the world, the idea has to be that you also have to be a top 40, top 30 sort of a student. The idea is that there are at least two or three areas that you've indulged in, that you've expressed your interest in, and that you've pursued for a long period of time. Long period of time to show discipline, long enough to show consistency, and long enough to have actually meaningfully contributed to that particular leadership position, club, activity, interest area, whatever. In order, and Suganda Ma'am was just showing us some of the acceptance rates of these universities. For example, let's take a Harvard, which is at a 5%, 6% acceptance rate. In order to be accepted at a university like Harvard, you have to be in the top 5% of the applicants that apply to Harvard, which is around 30, 40,000, as many as possible, right? In order to be in the top 5% of an incoming um, applicant pool at Harvard, you have to be in the top 5% of particular sort of areas that you have picked in terms of your interest areas. So 9th, 10th, and 11th graders, this is your cue to sit back, take a step back, think about what your interests are academically, think about what your interests are outside of academics, and see if there are intersection between these interests that you want to go do a deep dive on. My only takeaway from this essential slide is going to be do not involve yourself in so many activities and not deep dive into any one of them. What that shows to the university is that you are still at an uh, exploration early sort of a stage and you haven't figured out completely what you essentially want to go get or what your interests are or what you would pursue in undergrad. While that is okay for some, essentially as international students, it's not going to be a very solid criteria for a university to accept you. So for all of the 9th, 10th and 11th students that are here, my recommendation would be to take a clean slate, just look at everything that is ahead of you in terms of activities, in terms of interests, in terms of clubs that are available, and then make sure to deep dive into at least one or two and make sure to try and understand how good or how bad these things are for you and then continue down that path. Students who are in their seventh, eighth, and ninth grades, congratulations, you're attending this session. You have so much more time to essentially sit down and think holistically about what are my interest areas. Most students often find either interest within academic subjects or find interest outside of academia. You could be a great football player. The guitar from seventh grade, seventh grade onwards. You could be someone who really likes to debate, go out for model UN competitions, etc. But that is something that you have to keep doing consistently and with a disciplined mind and keep doing it for a longer period of time to actually make any meaningful contributions and strides in that particular area. So the one thing to take away from this slide, be a master of a couple of specializations, specialize in a couple of things. At the same time, also have a pretty good overall GPA, good grades overall, average participant, let's say, in a multiple um, sort of setting, multiple extracurriculars, et cetera. But there have to be two or three things that jump out, all right? The importance of conversations. The other day, one of the most important things that Sleeker and I talk about is the fact that when we were applying to both undergraduate and graduate schools, one of the biggest things that we did not have is social media. Social media was just uh, coming up. It was the time of Facebook. There was no LinkedIn. Um, it was also, there, there was also no Snapchats for us to put fancy filters on our face uh, with the elephant ears and all of that. Um, thanks, thanks to that. But again, there's one aspect of social media that we could not take advantage of. And this is the fact that literally all of the world is available on social media. On platforms like Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, or LinkedIn, one of the most important communities that exist is this community of peers, is, is this community of peers who've graduated maybe three or four years, who are elder to you by three or four years, and have gone on to really good places. The biggest thing you can do today to build your profile is to identify what your interests are, identify what careers exist for those interests, 
and then identify the courses that you can do to get into these careers. How do you do the first thing? How do you identify what your interests are? If there was, um, you know, a magic potion that you could just take in and you figured out what your interests are, that could be great, right? There actually is. This magic potion essentially is not something as uh, easy or quick as drinking water, but this magic potion is the power of internet, is the power of these social media communities that you essentially need to tap into. You can understand the realities of pursuing various careers. You can understand, for example, you talk to someone who's a lawyer and not uh, uh, who's a lawyer who's studying up to law school, maybe who is maybe three or four, or maybe five years ahead of you in terms of career, in terms of what grade you're in. Once you have those conversations, a lot of different things sort of open up. Once you have these conversations, you can gain inspiration from what the mentor was like three or four years ago or whenever they were in your own position. What sort of courses did they take? What sort of path did they follow? What sort of internships did they do? And how did they mold their profile to get into whatever university slash college slash career they've been able to get into, right? So understanding the realities of pursuing different career fields and thinking about what you're getting into before you get before you actually do it is one of the most important things. There's a running joke in India, um, and this is probably meme material for everyone that's joining in. You could probably put out memes of this. Every single engineer that I've met did not get into engineering for the sake of engineering. Every single engineer that I've met has gotten into engineering because they didn't know anything otherwise. Like in India, the, the sort of traditional realm has so far been either engineering or medicine. And so the aim here, by having these conversations, irrespective of what cultural backgrounds you come from, et cetera, is to make sure that you know what you're exactly getting into. So the first point of profile building is to identify interests. And you can identify these interests by talking to as many people from a diverse group of population as possible. How do you do that? Leverage social media. So this particular slide concentrates on the importance of having conversations, importance of identifying your interests and then further building all along those interests and then sparking that identity, which only happens through individual personalized sort of conversations. So an action item on this particular slide, if you guys don't already do, go on to this platform called linkedin.com. You might think it's a little too early. That's absolutely fine. You can create a bare bones profile of yourself, but you can look at and follow a bunch of different people on LinkedIn. The power of that network is absolutely immense. The number of people that post about their paths, the kind of work they are working on, the kind of startups that they have created, and the kind of problems they are pursuing or going after, those are things that can inspire you guys, that can help you guys think about what you want to do as well. So action item on this slide, go ahead today, tomorrow, set up your LinkedIn profiles, all right? So the first point is figuring out what your interests are. That's critical for profile building. Once you've figured out your interests, the second point is going to be figuring out potential careers that come out of that. You could do it interchangeably as well. You could look at potential careers that are out there today, but the only problem with that is some of the careers that existed today did not exist five years ago. For example, a social media marketing analyst, right? Sounds fancy. But essentially, it's optimization of a lot of ads that you see. I'm sure a lot of you are on Snapchat and Instagram, and a lot of these ads sort of pop up. Optimizing those ads, making sure that you are the right target audience to see a certain ad, that has become a career and a role in itself. That did not exist five years ago. So we would recommend that you first sit down and think about whether you like math, science, um, intersection of math and art, intersection of computer science and public policy and a lot of different things, right? So first figure out your interests. The way to figure out interest is to talk to as many people as possible. And then the second part would be to figure out careers that exist today at the intersection of all of these interests and careers that you could create for yourself five years down the line, again, at the intersection of these various interests as such, all right? So that's, that's my slide. The action item on this is to go explore your interests and careers that exist at the intersection of these interests. All right, a lot of people 
would essentially come to me at this point and say, hey, Suraj, I've thought about a couple of my interests. I have figured out that I'm really good and interested in math. I'm really good and interested in logical puzzles outside of academia. I'm also interested in, let's say, um, um, human anatomy. I'm interested in debating model UN. I'm a really good public speaker. So I want to find out whether a particular career is for me or not. So the second step to profile building after you've figured out interests and, and potential careers is to actually do a live six month, three to six months sort of a project, internship or activity within the intersection of these various interests that you've essentially picked up. Let's say you've picked out a couple of interest areas for yourself. Let's say you've picked out computer science, you've picked out public policy or, or model UN as one of the activities that you're really interested in that, that you see yourself doing for a pretty long time, either just through high school or college. And let's say you also need to know, uh, you also know how to build websites. You actually want to sit down and understand how, how a computer functions, for example, right? There is no substitute to understanding what careers are going to look like without you spending a little bit of time in the same shoes as someone who's doing that particular or who is in that particular career. The best way to essentially understand what, whether you like something or not is by doing it. Therefore, projects, internships, and all of these different activities that you can do to showcase your interest is a great way to set yourself apart from everyone else not just from a university admissions perspective, but also from a clarity of thought perspective. You become much better at explaining what your interests are. You become much better at yourself understanding whether this is the path I want to go down or not. Not so much about the company. It does not matter as much what company, what um, specific role you're getting into, um, what um, sort of big startup versus corporate versus individual project within within the high school, et cetera. All of those things won't really matter as long as the kind of work that you're doing, the particular role and the impact of the work that you're doing is pretty high. For example, a couple of students um, essentially were interning within their own high school. And I'm not even talking about going out of the high school to a corporate or to, um, let's say, um, uh, uh, I have a question, I'll, I'll get back to you, Roshni, but let's say I'm not even talking about a company or a, a startup or an MNC or anything of that sort, just within your own high school, right? If there are particular subjects that you were interested in, go approach the teacher, ask them to set you up with a project that you can do by yourself. Second, there are so many websites across the world that will give you problem statements. For example, Kaggle is one, K-A-G-G-L-E. Kaggle is a huge data community. Kaggle is one of the biggest communities where all data sets are available. Let's say you're trying to understand some of the statistics that Suganda ma'am was showing you was IB and the percentage of how IB, IB students can get into Ivy League universities. That exists as a data source on Kaggle. If you are actually curious about it, there are two things you can do. Go on to Kaggle.com, download the data set as an Excel, learn how to manipulate numbers on an Excel sheet, figure out and do a little bit of analysis, formulate some questions, and then try and understand how those statistics come up, how you can you know, sort of build your own um, uh, IBDP portfolio or curriculum, et cetera. And then do a little bit of digging around in terms of questions that you can answer that becomes a project of its own. Again, the beauty of projects is that it could be very, very well structured as in a, com uh, in a com company, in a MNC, in a startup. It could also be unstructured sort of questions that you have that you deep dive in. So be curious, take up as many projects and internships as you can get in terms of opportunities. This could either be opportunities outside of school or within school. The third part of it is the leadership aspect. I am sure that not only at Elpro, but also all of the other schools that you guys are joining in from, there are a bunch of clubs, 
and there are a bunch of activities that the school itself offers as part of leadership it would be great if you guys can get a sense of everything that's going on fit yourself into a particular club that you were interested in and slowly build your way to taking additional responsibility within that club so projects leadership internships these are three critical things that you could do to not only set yourself apart from everyone else that's applying to colleges and universities but also to deep dive within your interest and understand for yourself whether this is the path i want to go down or not let's go back again in order to build your profile you need to know one your interests two what careers could exist at the intersection of your interests and three what courses to pursue all of these three things will be clarified if you sit down talk to as many people and then look at it from a project based learning look at it from an internship based learning or go do some sort of leadership activities or um, extracurricular activities within the school or outside of the school and then deep dive and see if that is something that you are interested in all right let's take a couple of questions do, do companies outside take students of our age in internships absolutely yes if you are a 10th grader 11th grader or a 12th grader there are multiple companies both online as well as offline which will give you the opportunity to essentially intern or do a project with them that's within india one of the most important things and that's point number 4 is email linkedin and other social media platforms one of our interns who was in 10th grade what he did was that he had this innate curiosity about something called human clock right we all know that there's a there's an internal clock of some sort that tells us when to wake up when to sleep whatever right so this boy was very very interested in that and therefore literally scoured the internet starting from a very basic wikipedia sort of a google search wikipedia went into the depths read some research papers found out the authors of these research papers who were professors at mit and simply leveraged social media and email to send them an email saying hey prof i am a 10th grader i understand basic biology i am very curious about the human clock that is within me because i am a night owl i i can't sleep too early i sleep very late at night so i'm trying to understand and so i read a bunch of your papers which say that the human clock essentially adjusts to a lot of our surroundings etc i found that research very very interesting is there a way you can give me 30 minutes of your time and i have couple of questions for you that you can answer right this is someone in 10th grade who was genuinely curious about certain things deep dove deep into that particular research area and emailed a professor at mit irrespective of you know not thinking whether that professor is going to reply not reply etc this professor actually replied back set up time with him and two years later for the two years was working with that professor and two years later he is a student current uh, second year undergraduate student at the biology lab at mit he got into a bunch of other universities as well so genuine curiosity and being able to use social media as a tool is one of the most important things that we have are there companies absolutely are there professors absolutely you just have to make sure to understand what your interests are first and then find the pioneers in those sort of uh, in those sort of interests people that are doing great work follow them along for a little bit do your research about them and then shoot out emails shoot out connection requests etc and talk to them in terms of how they got started what you can do to contribute to some of the work that they are doing all right can we do internship and put it in our university form or is this after completing university this is in order to get into university that's the internship project leadership experience that i'm talking about as a high school student every single student that is um, you know aspiring to go abroad for their undergraduate studies should ideally have figured out their interests and then dove deeper into figuring out whether that's the right path for them or not and the best way to do that at the same time amplify their profile is to do projects or internships where can we find these companies great question one of the examples that i gave you is once you found out your niche or your interest area find the pioneers for example 
uh, Noam Chomsky, if you're someone who's really interested in linguistics, language, English, at the intersection of computer science, Professor Chomsky is someone who's at MIT, who you could write to, he replies, right? Then there are professional tools like LinkedIn. Then there is this, this online portal called Intern Shala, where you can essentially log in. There are a bunch of posts, et cetera, and you can put up those, uh, you can uh, essentially apply to those um, jobs and internships. Multiple ways to figure it out, but a simple Google search, and you could do this right after the call and you'll be surprised by the results. High school internships for students in India. If you just do that, you will get hundreds of different websites that offer internships. So there is no excuse right now. Five years, 10 years ago, sure. There is no excuse right now. All right, we'll, we'll, I think questions are pouring in now. We'll, we'll get back to questions in just a little bit. I promise to take every single one of these questions right after I'm done with all of the structured sort of slides that I have. Demonstrating interest. Um, one of the biggest things that Indian students particularly do not do, they will fill their forms. They will be top of their class. They will be really good academically. They will have great grades. They will be um, prompt in terms of filling out applications, but they do not take that extra step. They do not show that they're really interested in a particular university. Understand from a university's perspective, right? And this is guided by both logic as well as precedents or examples, past examples. Every single thing, every single bit of yarn that I'm giving you, is essentially something that I've observed through my journey or through the journey of dealing with thousands and thousands of undergraduate kids that are, or high school kids that are moving to undergrad. There are two potential things that I'm gonna talk about in terms of demonstrating interest from a university's perspective, as well as from a student's perspective. Let's say I am a student admissions counselor at MIT. I am in charge of reading 3000 applications. Do you really think that a committee of about 20 or 30 readers will be able to go through every single thing on every single university's uh, uh, university application? It's not going to be possible. Universities and readers essentially remember certain students that have shown or demonstrated interest. Demonstrated interest is essentially not going above and beyond filling the application form. Visiting campuses or in this time taking virtual tours. Constant contact with the top interest choice. Constant contact with, let's say, university admissions officers, just asking them casual questions about, hey, I'm doing these, what do you think I could build on? The same questions that you're asking me, you could essentially figure out and just email these guys and um, there's a question, where do I find these email IDs? Every single one of these email IDs is going to be available on the website, on the university website for the particular counselor, professor, every single detail is going to be available. It's publicly available detail for everyone to go out and take advantage of, right? I'm not saying hound them with continuous emails. They're also busy people. So keep in mind that you might or might not get replies. But from our end, there has to be some sort of an interest that you show in that particular university and a course. That's another way to stand out and build your profile to set yourself apart from everyone else that's coming in. The second thing is universities get thousands and thousands and lakhs of applications. They are looking to admit students who, if given an admit, have a high probability of coming and joining the university. For example, there's, there's University X. Its intake is 10,000 students. It gets one lakh applicants, right? The university also needs to be very, very sure that if it gives you the 999th admit as compared to someone else, they want to know whether you will attend the university or will you attend some other university. As much as it is a choice for the university to take you in, it's also a choice for you to whether, uh, whether you want to attend that particular university or not, right? So demonstrating interest in this particular case specifically concentrates on how you show interest towards that particular university. One big example is tailoring essays. Most US universities, most universities abroad will have essays that you will have to write about the particular university and why you wish to attend them. Don't talk very, very, um, you know, at a 10,000 feet level. Hey, I like the university because it's one of the top 10 universities. 
right? That is very generic. Tailor the essay specifically to what you like about the university. I went to Carnegie Mellon because I loved the program which offered me insight into public policy, which offered me a great depth in the energy sector and offered me the chance to take electives or courses in data science and artificial intelligence and apply them to my domain knowledge expertise, which is the area of interest, which is energy in my case, right? So when you go specific about a university and why you wish to attend that, universities are convinced a lot more that you know why you're applying, that you know that if given the admit, you are a serious applicant who will come to the university. Tailoring essays when you are applying is another way of demonstrating interest. Another way to demonstrate interest would be to attempt all the optional essays. Taking time out, researching the particular university, the course, the um, sort of uh, culture, the vibe of the university, etc. All of these combine together within the umbrella of demonstration of interest. And that's another way you can essentially build your profile. If there is one thing that you take away from this conversation, it's that you absolutely need to start thinking about applications early. For students who are looking to apply abroad, 10th grade, 9th and 10th grade are your best times to start figuring out and start doing a little bit of the groundwork. Because once you come into 11th grade, you're already sucked into a particular stream and domain. You're already taking a particular set of subjects. And so because you're taking those set of subjects, some of the majors and minors are essentially closed off to you. So critical steps should and the foundation should be laid in ninth and 10th grades. And that's the start thinking about applications early piece that I'm talking about. It's not that in your 12th grade, I'm applying to universities now. And so I will start thinking one month in advance, not going to help you guys. Start thinking from ninth and 10th, start building your profile from ninth and 10th. And therefore it becomes a lot easier for you guys to essentially set yourself apart, set yourself apart from an interest, from a career, from a course, and from a university perspective. One last thing is this age old question of how do I stand out from the rest? This will, I promise, be the last one or two slides before we take a bunch of these questions. I would also really appreciate, guys, if you could send the questions out to everyone. I think a lot of direct messages are coming in. If you can send the questions out to everyone, everyone sort of has an idea about the question that I'm addressing and they have their mind structured and oriented towards that. So just a request, if you have questions, please send that out to, um, uh, I don't know who the admin is. I don't think there's permissions. So if you could figure it out, that'd be great. All right, how to stand out from everyone. One, and if there is, again, I'm harping on this as much as I can. If there is one thing that you take away from the session today, let it be that you have to begin early. Ninth and 10th grades are absolutely the perfect time to essentially start out. Second, be yourself. In this age where you know what the other person is doing within your class, when you know what your peer is doing, one of the most important things is to be genuine be what you are, but the best version of what you are, right? It's not copying or aping someone. It's not saying, hey, that person has an interest in this. That could be something that I'm also interested in. Sit down, reflect, figure out what you want, and then be yourself, all right? Consider what is very important to you. There are students that think that advocacy, human rights, being a lawyer, all of these things are important. There are students that think that computer science, being able to code, being able to put some stuff together, all of that is important. But introspect, understand what is important to you and learn more about it. Be curious, guys. There's, there's, there's literally one thing that will help you throughout your life, irrespective of what stage you're at, is being curious, asking questions. That's one of the most important things you can cultivate as a habit. Tailor your essays, showcase your speciality, and demonstrate interest. Again, for the benefit of everyone, what is a good profile? A good profile is not someone who's participated in 20, 30 different activities and is a jack of all, master of none. A good profile or a good student or a good candidate 
is someone who's explored two or three interest areas to a great depth, has specialized in those, while at the same time, everything else on the profile is pretty solid as well, right? So there are two or three things that you deep dive, everything else you've maintained at the average or the above average mark for that particular university. All right, you have to understand what your interests are, you have to understand what careers are possible for those interests and what courses you can do for, for those careers to get into those careers. All these three things are possible by doing two things particularly. One, talking to as many people as possible, diverse set of individuals. And if, you're, if you guys are interested, Grad1 can help you with some of that. Second, doing projects, internships, or some sort of practical work in the areas of interest that you have. These are two things that will help you understand and um, sort of set yourself apart, of course, from a university perspective, but also give you additional clarity in terms of what you need to do to become the best at whatever interest area you've essentially picked. All right. That's pretty much it from me um, for the structured part of the session today. I'm going to leave this slide on. This is some of the services that Gradvine offers. Um, we are, a, like I said, peer to peer mentorship organization. We help with the profile building aspects. We also help with the applications part of it. I'm going to leave this slide on and dive deep into some of the questions that I see here. Also, um, Sugandha, ma'am, if you're around, if you can make it open to everyone, I think that uh, makes I've it I've done that, for... Suraj. Yeah, okay, yeah, I've done that. Great. All right. Um, I'm interested in artificial intelligence. Could you please suggest some sites where I could do internships? Two sites for you, uh, Grishma. One is Kaggle, K-A-G-G-L-E. Actually, three sites for you. One is Kaggle. Two is worlddata.ai. And the third is essentially on LinkedIn. I cannot emphasize the kind of projects, et cetera, that are put up. You could also look at intern Shala and see if there are internships within the area. But Kaggle and worlddata.ai are your two best friends. How much does volunteering matter? What did you as a, a what did I do as a student volunteer or what can other students volunteer in? All right, let's look at it very, very holistically, right? Volunteering essentially is being able to contribute or give back to society. How much does it matter is, is something that is very, very relevant and depends upon what sort of work you're doing. You could essentially, and this is something that every single high school student sort of puts up on their profile, go to a, a old age home or to an orphanage or to teach some uh, lower income, lower community sort of um, students. But that is something that everyone sort of does. When you've done it for consistently for a long period of time and you've tracked the impact that you've had, that is when volunteering starts to matter. If it is something that you are doing just to put up on your profile, not going to matter as much. Because of COVID during 2020, a lot of students were not able to cope with the schooling and has impacted their profile building uh, tremendously. Our university is going to take that into account. I'm going to answer that question with two bases. One is a logical basis and two from a very experiential or uh, past relevant case study sort of a method. Logically speaking, just as much as high school students have been affected, so have college administrations and admission staff themselves. One of the biggest things universities look for in an application reader or someone who's evaluating your application is empathy. They have also gone through the same ordeal that you guys and I and everyone around us has gone through. So there is absolute consideration for students who are graduating now or who are, who've graduated last year or will graduate next year. Universities understand that it was a tough time. Therefore, they have re relaxed some of the entry criteria. If you noticed, universities have essentially relaxed or made standardized tests like the SAT, ACT, etc. optional so that students don't face the trouble of, you know, my test got cancelled, I couldn't give it, or I couldn't cope up with the studies, so I couldn't get a really good score, etc. 
So universities 100% are human beings just like us. They understand that the entire world has gone through something that we've never seen before. And therefore are very empathetic to all of the students that are going to be applying. What if our interests are non-academic? Sports, music, absolutely, Mantan. I mean, one of my interests as, as a young adult who was in high school was debating, was model UN, was public policy, etc. None of these things, I come from a CBSE school, so none of these things were offered to me as part of academia. Irrespective of that, what we have to essentially understand is if you have identified these as your interest areas, if you are in the top 5% of the work that you do in that particular interest area, then you've essentially set yourself apart. So it's great that you sort of have an inclination of what my interests are, dive deep into it. First of all, identify whether those are actually your interest areas or whether they are hobbies. And that's a very, very big difference, right? Interest areas could potentially turn into careers, so can hobbies, but hobbies are not pursued very, very seriously. If a hobby is pursued seriously, it becomes an interest area, all right? So the base could be in seventh, eighth grade, you can have a bunch of hobbies and you can pick and choose two or three that become your interest areas and then talk to as many people as possible who've made themselves a career out of these interest areas. We have a bunch of students, et cetera, who are now professionals. Of course, we've been doing it for the past, uh, for the past five, six years now. Um, uh, a couple of them, were great hobby football players in their high school, in their seventh, eighth grade, took up the sport, very, very interesting um, sort of uh, turn, took up the sport seriously in their high school, and then went on to study the sport, the science behind the sport, and are now assistant managers, work with the club, back office, analytics, etc., at clubs or European clubs like Manchester United, at places like Liverpool and Sheffield. Right. So if you have an interest in sport, even within sport, do you like playing it? Is there a particular science that you like about it? Is the character building aspect of it something that interests you, etc.? So dive deep again. As many whys, why, 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 why? I know you guys play 20 questions, right? You guys always almost always question parents if they're doing something like this. Why? You ask them why, why? It's a good practice. Do that with yourself. Do that introspectively when you say XYZ is my interest area. Are there internships for those who want to pursue medical careers? Absolutely, yes. And uh, they're just not called internships. They're called volunteering activities or shadowing. So as part of internships for science-based, et cetera, they can actually do projects. With medicine, if you are looking to become a psychologist, um, a, a doctor specializing in something, et cetera, the best way you can show interest in that area is by volunteering with a clinic or volunteering or shadowing a doctor who's a specialist in that particular area. That concept is not so popular yet in India, but is, is, is the base that is accepted in the US. So shadowing is something that you can do. If there are um, uh, clinics close by, if there are doctors in your community, in your network that are specialists at certain things, you could go shadow them you could go watch them do certain things, of course, with proper permissions, safety guidelines, et cetera, especially in, in today's world. Is there any structured way to, to find out kids' interests? Unfortunately, the only tools, the only tool that is available in the market is something called a psychometric test. We've seen research in the last 10 years that shows how ineffective psychometric tests are. Understand that when a student is sitting down to give one of these tests, they're probably in a world of their own. They are not thinking about the things on the test. They're thinking about the PT period or the, or the games and sports period that's upcoming or something else completely different. And so while standardized, uh, standardized tests and these tests themselves, could be a great indicator of what the student is good at. They're never a good indicator of what the student has an interest to pursue later on. Just because someone is good at something does not mean they make that their career, right? Is there a structured way? Yes, 
the structure is conversations and project-based learning. This is not something that I am coming up with. This is something that 20 years of research at places like Harvard, Stanford, early school, early system education, MIT Multimedia Lab, which is the K through 12 lab, and my alma mater, Carnegie Mellon and the University of Chicago. It's a joint study that was conducted for 20 years. And these are the results of that, which have been taken up by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as well. And they say that the structure needs to be in terms of exposure to opportunities, exposure to people, and exposure to projects. If you want more, much more structure, of course, Gradvine offers some of these services. So you could just schedule your free consultation call on the website, and we should be able to talk to you guys about that. Wanted to ask about financial aid. How does the financial aid process work for a top university like MIT or Harvard? Very similar to admissions process. If you're top 5%, they will give you an admit. If you're top 1%, they will give you financial aid. That's the, that's the scholarship part of it. There is also financial aid based on need. So if there is a financial need, you can't attend college or there is a financial need to attend college, then depending on the endowment of the particular university, that is also something that is possible. Unfortunately, if you are not a US citizen or that particular country citizen, there might be very, very few opportunities as an international student applying for financial aid. But if you are good enough, if you are at the top 1%, 2% of incoming students, you will get scholarships. How would you compare getting into IITs and getting into a university abroad? I don't think I'm qualified to answer that question, but I will sort of take a very small uh, attempt at it. I never went to an IIT, so I do not know. I, I will not claim to know what the IIT pattern is. I did, however, go to a university abroad and uh, a top 10 university in the world. So what I can tell you is that these universities place a lot more emphasis on personalized learning on individual application of whatever you've learned in terms of assignments that are very real life, projects that you essentially have to do, which are very, very realistic and help you transition to the professional career. So that would be, I think, one of the biggest differences, but I don't think I am the right person to sort of answer that question at a very deeper sort of level. I'm interested in cars. My goal is to open a car showroom. What subject should I go? Let me demonstrate a use of the question why. Let me ask you, why are you interested in car? Which part of the car? Are you interested in the engine? Are you interested in how the automobile actually functions? Are you interested in why there are regulations and rules in terms of lane markings? Are you interested in the car from a marketing perspective? When you ask yourself these four or five questions and then peel layers, it's just like an onion, right? You keep peeling, you keep peeling, you get to the core of it. And that's where you will figure out what course to apply. If you are someone who is very interested in understanding why there are white lines on a road, why there are lanes on a road, why the traffic signal is placed at the junction, why there is sort of um, what is the timing behind the traffic signal? How can I sell some of these cars, etc.? You could be much more into the liberal arts or making sure to get into marketing, management, public policy, etc. If you're someone who thinks intuitively about how is a car running, what is petrol, how am I putting petrol and the car is actually running, etc., you could be interested in the science aspect of things, right? So asking these why and what questions is what is going to help you. I don't think, again, of course, you can talk to as many people as possible to get a better understanding of this as well. But one of the most important things you can do is ask yourself these questions. Um, without reading out the name of the student, how do I resolve conflicts of interest if parents and my views don't really match? Very, very pertinent question. One that comes up a lot. I think one of the most important things you can do is as a student, clearly articulate what your interest areas are and why. Once you're able to tell 
your parents hi guys my interest areas are these 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 i'm very interested in dance i'm very interested in music i am very interested in whatever extracurricular co curricular academic subject that i'm taking up i have talked to one two three four five people in this field every single one of them has given me certain tidbits advice and paths that they have taken based on all of these conversations i have sort of identified a couple of things that i want to do to both build my profile as well as in the future pursue a career in this particular field when you give them logic plus data back insight i think parents will also try to sit down with you and understand and will put up counterpoints the only way to resolve conflict is through conversation and dialogue even for those conversations and dialogues to happen you need to know what your core interests and careers you're choosing the majors the courses that you're choosing are so that would be the first step identifying why you're getting into that would be the second step the third step would be having deep meaningful conversations themselves looking at a couple of question i think hardik um, bunch of messages from you yeah let me just get to that should i do 11th and 12th grade in europe or usa um i think i think that's a very subjective sort of a question you could do it in india you could do it in the us you could do it in europe i don't think that um uh, is anything you, you need to worry about from a 11th and 12th grade perspective maybe going abroad for college might make sense maybe studying in india also might make sense for you so it depends on a bunch of different things in terms of what your interest areas are samriddhi essentially asked what is the time frame for graduating out of us universities or what is the time frame for applications um i think uh, sugandha ma'am will get back to you with maybe a future session where we will do a bunch of timelines for applications not just profile building but what what should you do when in terms of applying to any university abroad i think those are things that we will talk about uh, in in a future session so can i mean if you have any other questions i'm i'm not i'm seeing a bunch of repeat questions that i've already answered so if there are any specific questions that you would like me to answer Please, there's just uh, one please uh, suraj which is uh, you know my interest lies in space science and i wanted to know if nasa recruits indians okay okay let's let's talk about that right so being an indian does not preclude you from going and working in space science to understand that nasa first of all understand that nasa is not the only space agency that works in space science there are a bunch of other indian international and other space agencies there are also private companies that work in space science to answer your specific question yes nasa does not care about except for core national security related topics and development nasa will 100% recruit anyone irrespective of what their nationality is for some of their projects of course there are going to be some very critical projects that because of citizenship you will not be able to work on but if you are again the top 1% 2% at what you do they will find a way around it they will find a consultant position or anything something along the lines of that to be able to utilize your talents i am interested in aerospace engineering how am i supposed to do an internship which benefits me first of all um, vivek understand what aerospace engineering itself is it's it's i, I if you were thinking about rockets and um, you know airplanes flying very little part of aerospace engineering is that <coughs> excuse me aerospace engineering specifically has a lot of mechanical design so design of elements design of parts and components has a lot of 
thermodynamic concepts built in has a lot of newton's law sort of built in as well so escape velocity gravity all of these things that concepts that you are probably studying now in physics are basics that you need for any sort of engineering let alone aerospace so think a little deeper figure out what within aerospace you are interested in are you interested in propulsion if you are then try and build a simulator a computer simulator based on data that essentially identifies what is the thrust that is required to escape the velocity i mean to for 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 anything to achieve escape velocity so let's say you have a rocket which is mass x you have to escape the earth's gravitational pull which is downwards what is the thrust that is required and in order to generate that thrust what is the amount of fuel required for that particular mass of the rocket very simple thing it's a brilliant project for you to pursue in your 9th and 10th grades if you are able to build the simulator that becomes an internship or a project that you can showcase to get into aerospace engineering very very simple things that you you know boil down to fundamental concepts and work on those fundamental concepts essentially okay i think we have a bunch of more questions graduating from abroad how much is, does it differ from indian services and jobs i'm not sure i understand that question would you recommend yeah yeah would you recommend giving international exams in the later stages of 11th and 12th that increase your academic portfolio 100% if you are looking to apply abroad make sure to give the sat make sure to give the act or make sure to you know essentially take uh, advanced placement as if if the school offers it as an international student understand that you are not on the same level field as someone who is a us high school so you have to show a little extra as compared to them you have to show that you are actually deeply interested in attending that particular university and so in order to stand out you could take some of these tests yes ma'am go for it next question um this one which is interesting uh, how can we get an on campus job and is it enough for paying the tuition fee if one doesn't get a full scholarship absolutely again um, there are different kinds of on campus jobs right as an international student you will have to wait through a couple of visa issues immigration issues but yes there are at least from your second year onwards maybe not for the first year second year onwards there are an ample amount of on campus opportunities that you will have either as a research assistant under a professor a teaching assistant helping professors with certain courses or um, um helping the university overall with um administration your hostel admin your uh, library etc will it be sufficient to cover tuition maybe maybe not in most cases not it will however be enough to sustain yourself in terms of living costs maybe not tuition costs but living costs definitely apurva honestly you know spamming the chat with this question about how do we find time for these because studies in 10th consume all the time uh, suraj you would like to take that i graduated from high school a little too long ago um fortunately for me back then computers and internet was not the rage so i did not have to deal with you know a lot of distraction what i would recommend you do apurva is make a list of five things and only five things cut out everything else five things that you are interested in five things that you actually want to pursue and just do that cut out everything cut out and prioritize just those five things for two years and just keep plugging away plugging away consistently at these things that would be the best way the best tip that i can give you so i think the questions are pouring in suraj uh, we'll probably have to you know uh, with the paucity of time we'll probably have to uh, stop now but students i'm sure you know suraj sir will be more than happy to answer your questions if there are any and you can write them to me or you like you can reach out to uh, suraj himself uh, on the gradwine website um, and i'm sure they'll be more than happy to help you all uh thank you so much suraj for uh, you know being a part of our uh, study abroad series and as you can see the the interest and the kind of questions that are coming up and this is precisely why we want to do sessions like these because it matters a lot when it comes from uh, you know you guys who have been there done that 
who have you know who know about the nuances and uh, you can help actually you all have this great uh, you know capacity to help these young students so uh, thank you so much uh, on behalf of the entire uh, eis ibdp wing uh, we thank you i'd like to extend uh, my uh, gratitude to dr amrita vora our director principal uh, who is always the rock solid support and uh, the force behind us doing these things the force behind the uh, elpro international school getting their ib authorization so uh, thank you ma'am and uh, thank you all the parents and students who have joined us 